This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Peter Singer, who is the Ira W. DeCamp Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University's Center for Human Values. Professor Singer, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia. And looking back, how do you uh, think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, I think, uh, you know, my, my parents were immigrants to Australia. They were refugees from the Nazis. Uh, so they had arrived in Australia in 38, uh, eight years before I was born. Um, certainly their immigrant experience, uh, the fate of uh, their rem more extended family who were left in Europe and uh, many of whom became victims of the Holocaust, um, that certainly shaped my views. Uh, and so did Australian society, which I think is a reasonably open, uh, friendly, uh, egalitarian, tolerant society. So I'm sure that growing up in Australia had a, left a big impact on me. Uh, what was a uh, conversation around the dinner table like? What, what was, were anyone in your family interested in, in philosophy or was it a discussion of current events or sports? <laughs> Uh, well, no, there was no particular interest in philosophy as such, um, but not in sports either. Uh, there was certainly some about current events, about what was happening in the world. Um, there was perhaps a bit more interest in psychology. Um, my grandfather had been a colleague of Freud's in Vienna, had uh, worked with him and then later had worked with Alfred Adler. and. Uh, my mother was a medical practitioner, but she was interested in psychology. So that kind of topic came up. I was aware of that background, but I, I couldn't say that we had intensive discussions about either Freudian or Adlerian psychology around the dinner table. It, it may have come up occasionally, but uh, it wasn't a regular staple of conversation. And, and you actually, in, in, uh, later in your uh, uh academic career wrote a book about your your grandfather. Tell us a little I, about I did, it. Yes. Um, I, I wrote not that long ago really, maybe uh, what, 10 years ago or something like that, um, a book called Pushing Time Away, uh, My Grandfather and the Tragedy of Jewish Vienna. Um, as I said, I'd known about my grandfather and his work with Freud uh, all my life. Um, I knew that he'd written a, a book and um, a number of other articles that were published in journals. Um, my mother uh, and my aunt uh, had those works. They also had some letters from him. Um, but I hadn't really read them. Uh, they were in German. I, I do read German, but I read it more slowly than uh, I read English. And uh, I had guess not felt it was really a priority for me to read them until as I started to get older, I thought, well, if I don't do this soon, I'll never get to know what my grandfather was like, what his ideas were like. Uh, and so I started to read some of this, and as I read, I thought um, there is a lot of interesting material here, a lot of different kinds of material, private letters as well as the more uh, academic articles, um, the history of the, the Freudians in the early days and the breakup that led to the split off from the Adlerians. Uh, so I decided to write about that, and then I also wrote about the tragedy of uh, what happened, why my grandparents did not come with my parents to Australia and uh, their sad fate. And, and the, the title is interesting, and where did that come from, Pushing Time Away? Uh, that title comes from a letter that my grandfather wrote to my grandmother before they were married. Um, one of, 
it seems silly today, but um, my grandfather's parents objected to him, objected to his proposal of marriage to my grandmother because she was three years older than him. And uh, in those days, it was expected that men would marry women younger than them rather than older. Uh, so he wrote to her that, uh, that what unites us pushes time away. Basically, I suppose he was saying that we have an intellectual companionship, an intellectual union, not merely one based on physical attraction. And uh, I thought that that struck me as a good phrase for what I was trying to do in writing about my grandfather and my grandmother too. Um, I was trying to push time away so that I could get to know them despite the fact that they, uh, certainly my, my grandfather had died before I was born. What did you learn from this uh, experience uh, uh, and, and how did that affect you personally? That is of writing the book. Well, um, I mean, I learned some personal things about the various sort of unfortunate semi-accidental circumstances uh, that prevented my grandparents from uh, leaving Austria. Um, and that was very sad. It was one of these things where you kept thinking, if only, if only this had happened slightly differently, if only they had had a better understanding of the urgency of leaving uh, and so on, the, they could have been saved. Um, uh, so there was certainly that. Um, I also got a sense of the intellectual background out of which uh, I came uh, and a, a better sense of, of what my grandparents were like and what the city in which they lived was like. So I had a better understanding of Vienna and uh, uh, in that sort of really, I think, you know, great period of Vienna from uh, around the turn of the century until uh, the Nazi takeover. Um, obviously, Vienna was a very lively and exciting city to be in um, with quite a large Jewish population and certainly some anti-Semitism, but still a fair amount of, of tolerance and acceptance um, with uh, the Jewish population of Vienna really playing a major role in its cultural life. One, one of uh, the themes in your work is a kind of a, uh, the universal application of values, if I can state it that way. Did, was that going through the, the history of the Jewish community there, did that sort of uh, impact you and, and, and uh, sort of confirm your feelings about, you know, the, 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 what happens when a, a, a group like the Nazis impose their will on populations and identify certain people as being outsiders? Uh, certainly there's, um, I mean, I think I didn't have to actually write the book. I think I already had that from my uh, childhood, the idea of the importance of preventing uh, authoritarian rule of this sort, um, the importance of establishing uh, basic guarantees, if you like, that uh, uh, minorities are not to be excluded in that way, um, discriminated against. Uh, yes, I, I think that was something I already had. You could say it was confirmed by the book, but I already had it solidly enough. Um, so I don't think the universal values come from that. I mean, if anything, what I got from the book was um, my grandfather's uh, immersion in the values of ancient Greece and Rome, because he was a classic scholar. Um, and uh, so he was really interested in values, and he was interested in uh, how to live ethically. Uh, he may not have used exactly that term, but he, he was interested in the ideas of the ancients. And so that sense that these ideas still speak to us and that we still have things to learn and things to share with all sorts of different kinds of civilizations and periods, um, that's something that uh, I perhaps did get from reading his writings. Uh, back to your education now, where, uh, where did you do your undergraduate work and then at what point in your education did you decide that philosophy was what you wanted to do? Uh, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Melbourne and uh, I was originally planning to do law um, but I got interested in uh, the humanities. Uh, for a long time I didn't decide between doing history and philosophy and I think I ended up doing philosophy because I felt there were bigger issues that I could look at and, and work at. This is at the time when I was 
thinking of going on to do some graduate work in one or the other in history or philosophy. And I chose philosophy because um, I could talk about really important issues about what's right and wrong and why we should act ethically. Whereas the history department wanted me to do some original research based on documents that had not been uh, really studied or written about that much. So uh, essentially they were pushing me to do something on uh, an area of less interest both to me and, and I think of less significance to the world as a whole. And then you went on to Oxford and did a, a, a DPhil there. Uh, I actually did a degree called a BPhil. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm unusual among ac academics in not having a doctorate um, because at the time, certainly as far as getting an academic job in Australia was concerned, uh, it was not necessary to have a doctorate. The Oxford degree uh, was a graduate degree. It's a two-year graduate degree involving a thesis as well as coursework. And uh, from the point of view of Australian philosophy departments, that was an ideal preparation for an academic career. And, and so in this, in this uh, uh, laying the foundation of your intellectual journey, what led you to utilitarianism? Um, I was already led towards utilitarianism as an undergraduate uh, by uh, one of my teachers there, a professor called H.J. McCloskey, who wrote about ethics uh, and actually was himself quite hostile to utilitarianism. But he did give it a fair presentation. And even as an undergraduate, I felt that uh, the objections he brought against it were not knocked down objections, that there were possible replies to those objections. Uh, and I remember already in undergraduate essays uh, pushing those replies and saying, well, this is not really a reason for not being a utilitarian. And then, you know, some other argument is not a good reason either. And in the end, I decided that none of the objections to utilitarianism that some other philosophers had thought were sufficient reason for uh, rejecting it, um, that none of them were really strong enough to persuade me to reject it. Uh, along the way here, you're, you're actually doing your education, uh, especially your work at Oxford in the 60s. So this was a, uh, I'm curious as to how all the events of the 60s uh, were shaping you and your actual involvement in uh, student organizations and, and other movements at that time. Right, that was actually at the University of Melbourne more than Oxford. I only went to Oxford in 69, towards the end of 69. Um, and uh, certainly the student movement was already quite strong at the University of Melbourne, particularly because Australia was involved in the Vietnam War. Uh, we were sending troops to fight alongside the Americans. Uh, and we uh, reintroduced conscription. There had been conscription previously, then there had been a period without it. It was reintroduced for the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, so there was a strong student movement of opposition to the war, and uh, I was part of that. I was actually president of a organization called Melbourne University Campaign Against Conscription. So um, I was pretty much involved in uh, anti-war activities uh, at that time and in the student movement. Um, and I think that definitely had an impact on me in thinking about uh, the importance of really living according to some principles and not just going along with what uh, society or the government was doing, but of forming your own views and standing up for them. So uh, when I got to Oxford, although as an Australian in Britain, I was not as politically involved directly, but when new issues came to my attention, like the issue of uh, the treatment of animals, for example, um, I think I was ready to say this is an important moral issue too and uh, we ought to take a stance about this. We ought not to go along with what society as a whole or the mainstream thinks is right because uh, it's not really right. So, so there, I, I, there is, when one uh, does a cursory examination of your work, uh, a kind of a link between your, the philosophical foundations of your work and uh, the activism uh, that on certain issues that you've gotten involved in. So it's, it, it's really 
practical ethics. Oh, in a very way. definitely. Yeah, it's a very yeah. direct link. I mean, I, I took up the issue of, of animal liberation not because I was an animal lover. I, I was never really an animal lover. I never particularly wanted to have pets or dogs or cats living around me. Um, I took this up as an ethical issue. It seemed to me that once I learned about the way we were treating animals, not just the, the dogs and cats that you see around homes, but in particular uh, animals in farms, in uh, factory farms, and uh, in, uh, used in research as well, this just seemed to me to be completely wrong. Uh, this seemed to me to have no ethical foundation at all. And uh, so I took it up as an ethical issue. It was very directly an offshoot of my philosophical uh, interest in ethics. Uh, I know that, uh, as you indicated in your lecture yesterday, that some of your thinking about utilitarianism is 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 changing as you do more and more work. But but help us understand what are the foundations of your thinking uh, as uh, as a student and a practitioner, I guess, of utilitarianism. Yes, and just to be clear, um, I'm not changing my thinking in the sense of abandoning no, utilitarianism. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there are some aspects as to what it is that we ought to maximize that I'm rethinking. But utilitarianism is the view that we ought to do what, all things considered, will have the best consequences. And that still seems to me to be absolutely right, that ultimately we must judge right and wrong in terms of the consequences of our action. Uh, the question is, what sort of consequences? For most of my life, I've been a preference utilitarian. That means I think the consequences we ought to look at are the extent to which our actions satisfy the preferences of all those conscious beings that have preferences about what we do, uh, as against thwarting or frustrating those preferences. I'm now um, perhaps leaning towards the view that the consequences we ought to be concerned about are reducing pain and, and maximizing pleasure or happiness. Um, so it's since, since obviously most sentient beings have preferences not to be in pain and, and to experience, have pleasurable sensations, it's not a huge difference, but philosophically it is a significant difference. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there are important features, as I understand it, of, of, uh, of, uh, of utilitarianism in the sense that th there is embedded here an, uh, the idea that uh, it, 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 you're egalitarian. In other words, the, these conclusions that you reach really apply to everybody, and, and it's hard to, to draw lines even between species, basically, is what you're saying. Yes, in, certainly in one sense I'm an egalitarian, and that is that I think that we ought to give equal consideration to similar interests, whether the interests are those of um, a, let's say, a man or a woman, or a person of European descent, or of Asian or African descent, and, and of course most people now would agree that we should not draw those distinctions, but I would say also, uh, if there, is, if there are non-human animals that have interests that we can roughly compare with our own, their interests are just as important as ours. Um, so that's a f uh, egalitarianism at a very basic level, uh, equal consideration of similar interests. Um, it doesn't mean that I think that uh, we ought to treat animals the same as humans, or even that we ought to treat all humans in exactly the same way. That will depend on what their interests are and how we can best meet or satisfy those interests. And, and so th it was this uh, thinking that, that uh, so furthered your embrace of what was an emerging animal liberation movement, namely that we can't just focus on our species, basically. Um, yes, but it, it may sound immodest, but there was actually no emerging animal liberation movement. Okay. Um, I think uh, my book came before the emerging animal liberation movement. Um, the term animal liberation was not used or known at all. Uh, there was really only a, a much more traditional animal welfare movement, uh, what would be represented in the United States by the humane societies, focusing largely on dogs and cats and uh, perhaps some attractive wild animals or horses or something like that. Uh, there was really no movement that was concerned about farm animals and factory farming. Um, and 
and there was there was an older anti-vivisection movement. That's true, but it was very much a minority. Most people would have written it off as just cranky. Um, so I think the the animal, what you could really call an animal liberation movement, uh, only emerged in the years following the publication of my book, Animal Liberation. And and let's explore that. And and I guess what I had in mind was you you uh, had friends and were in. Uh, discussions uh, about uh, 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 well let me ask you this how, how did you come to see the importance of this uh, in a context where there was no movement but it was an idea a set of yeah. ideas were emerging yeah. among your friends and the, your circle of acquaintances well that's that certainly I mean? true I mean I'm not going to claim uh, any sort yeah. of total uh, philosophical originality yeah. here um, I was fortunate enough to meet uh, a few other graduate students at uh, Oxford um, who were already thinking about uh, animals in a radical way. And um, there was a book published called Animals, Men and Morals, edited by Stanley and Rosalind Godlevich and John Harris, who were uh, philosophers at Oxford, but graduate students, not uh, academic staff. Um, who had started to think about this, and they'd collected a, uh, a number of essays. Um, so yes, I was part of that group, and I, I got a lot of uh, uh, thoughts and ideas from them, as well as uh, sources of factual information about what was happening to animals on factory farms. Um, Richard Ryder, who later wrote an important book called Victims of Science about the use of animals in science, was also at Oxford. Uh, so. Uh, there were a number of people, but but they hadn't actually formed any kind of movement. There were there were ideas uh, that I came in contact with, and that uh, really opened my eyes to the idea that there was this vast universe of uh, sentient beings who were just regarded as being outside the sphere of morality, and really. At that time, virtually nobody was seriously concerned with their interests. Uh, nobody spoke of animal rights as if they had any rights. Um, it was just the focus was just on humans, and the assumption was that uh, whatever happens to animals doesn't really matter that much. So, so I, it, this is fascinating because, uh, on the one hand, you had in, in, embraced certain philosophical assumptions, and, and they must have helped activate you to, to see the moral issues in these kind of discussions oh, that you that, yeah. that you were around yeah. and uh, but but then you took uh, talk to us a little about uh, the uh, uh, your approach to the New York Review to write a review of the the book that you discussed right. which then led to your own book yes. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, my friends had edited this book, uh, Animals, Men and Morals, and uh, they had some hopes that it would trigger a public discussion of the treatment of animals, but was published first in England, and it just sunk like a stone, really, without a trace. Uh, it was not reviewed by any of the major newspapers or Sunday papers or, or magazines. Uh, it was ignored, and this was just part of the phenomenon that I mentioned, that nothing about animals could really matter that much, so why bother reviewing a book that uh, talks about how we ought to treat animals? Um, so that was very disappointing for uh, my friends and very disappointing for me too. Uh, and then they got the news that um, there was going to be an American edition of their book. It was picked up by a relatively small publisher, uh, Taplinger. Um, and I thought, well, is there anything that could be done to prevent the book having the same fate in the United States that it had in Britain? And I got the idea, I was a regular reader of the New York Review of Books, I got the idea that uh, this was a place that was open to radical ideas because they published a lot of radical articles and, uh, about the Vietnam War, about uh, black liberation, about gay liberation and so on. Um, that it was widely read, it was the place that anybody who was on the left or politically radical um, and had some you know, intellectual standards would, would go to. 
Uh, and so I just, you know, wrote more or less out of the blue to the editor, uh, Bob Silvers. Um, I'd had no contact with him before. He'd certainly not heard of me. But I should mention that by this time I actually had an academic appointment at Oxford, um, which may have been useful. After I graduated in 71, I became a college lecturer, a very junior kind of academic appointment. But at least I could write on uh, un Oxford University note paper to him. And um, maybe that helped, I, I don't really know. I described the book, I described how I would write about it, and that really um, this was calling for an animal liberation movement parallel to the other liberation movements, uh, women's liberation, black liberation, gay liberation, that, that uh, we were familiar with. Um, uh, and that was not incidentally in the book. The book didn't really talk about animal liberation as a movement, but that was implicitly what it was doing. Uh, so um, uh, Bob Silvers was open-minded enough to write back and say, well, this sounds intriguing. Um, I'm not going to make any commitment until I see your piece, but certainly send it to us. We'd like to have a look at it. Um, so I wrote a review essay, as was, was typical of the New York Review. It, it doesn't just publish reviews that stick to the book. It publishes essays mm -hmm. around the book that develop the ideas of a book. Um, I wrote that piece. I called it Animal Liberation. I said that the book is a, a call for an animal liberation movement, a manifesto for an animal liberation movement. And I was absolutely delighted when uh, Silvers wrote back and said he liked the piece and they were going to publish it. Mm -hmm. And then a book, uh, the, the essay was then turned into a larger book. That's right. Then I got a number of letters after that was published, including one from um, an editor at uh, a New York publisher saying this is really intriguing, uh, would you consider writing a book on this? So um, that was what led to the book Animal Liberation. Uh, in in an autobiographical essay, you talk about a man who in the course of this you later met in a course you were teaching on animal living named Henry Spiro. And, and he actually took the uh, uh, activism to a new level in the sense of he, he was, a, I, I gather, a, a labor organizer in his past and so on, but actually uh, began focusing on getting corporations to, to change their uh, policies using animals and testing cosmetics and such other things. Yeah, that's right. Um, so just to follow my career, I'd had this two-year junior college lectureship at Oxford. Um, and although my wife and I, since we, she came from Melbourne as well, were, both, were planning to go back to Australia eventually, we wanted to raise our children in Australia, um, I had an invitation from New York University based partly on that uh, piece I wrote for the New York Review and another article I wrote called Famine, Affluence and Morality about Global Poverty for, uh, that was published in a more academic journal. So I had an invitation to, to, to come there uh, as a, for a temporary uh, assistant professorship. So I went, to, um, I went to New York University and I was working on writing the book Animal Liberation and I was invited to teach a uh, continuing education course. Um, so I decided to use the draft material that I had for the book um, and advertise this course and I, I can't remember, maybe 15, 20 people enrolled in the course. Um, and there was one man who really stood out because whereas the, those people who enrolled were predominantly female, women were more interested in animals at that time, I guess more open to that kind of what might have been seen as a sentimental view. Um, and also they were generally pretty polished, I guess, you know, sophisticated, you might say upper class people. Uh, there, was, there was a man who just from his accent uh, had much more of a working class background um, spoke in a rougher way, um, but was really interested in the idea that um, animals were an exploited underclass um, because that was where he'd come from. He'd come from, as you mentioned, the labor movement uh, and the idea that the working class is exploited and he was actually had got the point that just as the wealthier upper class tend to exploit the working class, so uh, the human species exploits animals. And um, at the end of the, the, the course, uh, he stood up and said, well, you know, this has all been very good, all this theoretical discussion, all very interesting, but um, uh, how about we actually try and do something about this? And if anybody from this group would like to talk with me about what 
we can really do. Uh, you can meet at my apartment at such and such a time. Um, so a little group did go to meet at his apartment and um, they started these campaigns, which uh, actually the first one was not against a corporation, it was against the American Museum of Natural History, mm -hmm. which is a big New York institution right there on uh, Central Park, very public. Uh, but what the public who went in to look at the dinosaur skeletons did not know is that in the upper floors, experiments were being conducted on cats that involved mutilating them and blinding them. Mm. Um, and when Spira got uh, FOI information about this and publicized it, he started a campaign that was the first campaign, I think, in the history of the United States to actually stop a series of animal experiments. Although the anti-vivisection movement had been going for a century or more, um, never before had it actually succeeded in stopping a set of animal experiments. So that was the first success, and then they went on to uh, campaign against cosmetics testing on animals, and they persuaded Revlon and Avon and other companies to put money into developing alternatives to the use of animals in uh, a lot of cosmetics testing. So, so there, there's an, a very interesting chain, a chain here in the sense of you, you have a philosophical foundation that goes back to utilitarianism, the, the nurturing uh, of the application of these ideas, really in the, the formulation of a problem because of this group you were interacting with, then the, the publication, but then the, the hard work of, uh, of organizing in a way to have an impact. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting chain because the, uh, uh, the, the, the notion you, you have written on on world poverty, uh, you've written on many things, but in the case of animal rights and world policy, the, the, there has been a subsequent effort to actually uh, practice uh, practical ethics, namely right. to apply them and to make it happen. Yes, that's certainly true, and I think you're right that there was a very clear connection between my utilitarianism, um, my view about both animals and global poverty, that there was a lot of suffering going on here that was unnecessary and could be stopped, um, and uh, eventually that it was necessary to take steps not just to write a book and publicize these things, but to really try to find mechanisms of bringing about change. And obviously I'm delighted that that has happened in the case of the animal movement, um, and to some extent is, is, is happening in the case of global poverty as well. And there, the, uh, how, how do you account uh, for uh, what has happened with regard to the poverty movement? Because here, in a way, you're, you're depending on existing organizations uh, and identifying them and may, uh, making them known to people who are motivated by the idea that you have, which has a foundation, again, in utilitarianism. Yes, that's right. Um, they are slightly different because, as I said, there was really no animal liberation movement yeah. and it was necessary to found new organizations, which is what Henry Spira did, and also, for example, uh, Ingrid Newkirk and Alex Pacheco founding People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, uh, and various other organizations that started. Um, because the, the older organizations, the Humane Societies and the RSPCAs in Britain, were generally seen as too conservative to change. I mean, fortunately, they have changed over the years um, to some extent, but uh, there, there were new organizations founded. In the case of global poverty, um, mostly the organizations were, were, were okay. You know, they were doing the job. Organizations like uh, Oxfam and uh, Save the Children and UNICEF and so on, uh, they were generally doing the job, but, but they didn't have the kind of resources going to them. And what I was trying to do was to get the idea that it is the responsibility of any of us who have money to spare, any of us who are living at a, a kind of level where uh, we can think nothing of spending, uh, you know, 30 or $50 on a meal at a restaurant or going to the theater or something like that, um, when these amounts might be all that a family has to live on for a month in uh, the developing countries. And uh, it's the lack of that kind of amount that might be a life or death difference in terms of getting medical care for a, for a sick child. So um, what I think was lacking there was the awareness in the general public 
that if we want to live an ethical life, we need not only to think about, you know, not cheating and stealing and, and harming those near us, but we need to think about what our responsibilities are to help those who through no fault of their own are living in dire poverty where um, their, li their living conditions are just not what we would regard as a decent minimum and their children may die from things like diarrhea or measles, um, diseases which we can prevent or easily cure in the developed world but which they don't have the resources to prevent or cure in the developing world. And in this particular case, it, 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 the added dimension of the web uh, creates a place where people can find out about your idea and actually link to organizations that would allow them to implement their change in thinking as a result of uh, the, the philosophical principles, shall we say, that you're working with. Yes, exactly. That's right. Um, so I wrote a book uh, called The Life You Can Save, and I set up a website, thelifeyoucansave.com, and people can go there and they can find out about my ideas. They can see suggested levels of giving that are uh, proportionate to people's income levels, uh, and they can find uh, links to organizations that I regard as highly effective in reducing global poverty, that they can make those donations too. So it is a kind of a, a, a one-shop stop um, for people who are interested in what they can do to help to reduce global poverty. Uh, this, this interesting combination of philosophical principles with activism uh, leads to a question of uh, what is it, what, what are the skills and temperament that it takes on the one hand to be a philosopher and on the other hand to be an activist? Yeah, that is an interesting question because they're not exactly the same. I mean, I think the problem is as a philosopher, you're very aware of all the nuances of your positions, of all the possible objections and uh, how you might counter those objections. And essentially, you're aware of the complications of defending any ethical view. Whereas as an activist, um, it's often better to have a somewhat simpler approach and just to focus on the main things and not get too complicated or nuanced in your approach. From a campaigning point of view, in reaching a wide audience, uh, you really, it's perhaps better to see things in somewhat more black and white terms. So I, I've often had that kind of conflict. I mean, I, I am professionally a philosopher, but I have, um, been involved in uh, many organizations that are campaigning organizations, particularly in the animal movement, but also regarding uh, global poverty. Uh, and I do sometimes have to sort of say to myself in a way, yeah, you know, if you were writing this for a philosophy book, you would write it slightly differently. But since what you're writing is a, mm -hmm. a leaflet or a, a statement to issue to the media, um, you have to be a little more straightforward and simpler um, in terms of doing that. Um, so that's one difference. Uh, the other thing is I think um, it takes a fair amount of persistence as a campaigner um, to get through to people and to, to make those breakthroughs. So you have to be prepared to be there for the long haul. Um, and that's quite important. I mean, I said fairly quickly that Henry Spira's group managed to stop those experiments at the Museum of Natural History. But they were outside that museum every weekend for, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was more than a year uh, before they did stop those experiments. So it did take um, a fair amount of persistence uh, to actually make that breakthrough. And, and that's really important as a campaign, campaigner. And it's something different from what philosophers might do, who you know might say, well, as long as this interests me, I'll keep working on this. But once it no longer interests me, I'll go and work on something else. In the, in the case of these books for public discourse, it, it really requires, on the one hand, a, a clarity of, uh, of writing, and on the other, sound, basic philosophical principles, because right. uh, uh, they both seem to be at work here. Yes, they are, and, and the, that conflict is definitely there depending on what audience you're writing for. So, for instance, my book, Practical Ethics, was really written to be used in philosophy courses. And it tries to look at the objections as much as you reasonably can and discuss them in a fairly uh, philosophical way. 
Um, if you look at either Animal Liberation or the book about global poverty, The Life You Can Save, um, they were both explicitly written for a broader audience. So um, the philosophy in them is not so uh, detailed, not so complex. Um, it's still there, and I certainly still stand by everything that I say, but if you're writing an academic book, it would be more complicated, I suppose. Um, whereas uh, what I wanted to do was to really state the basic essentials and then go into some of the practical aspects of uh, the facts of the situation that are relevant and what we can do about these situations. Now, another element of utilitarianism is this notion of being responsible for acts and omissions, basically. And it, it's in the area of uh, medical uh, uh, ethics, uh, where you've also done uh, path-breaking work, that, that those aspects come into play. Let, let's talk a little about that, because in that area, you, you were also a, a kind of uh, early into the game, so to speak, of uh, looking at the choices in medicine that were being created by the development of technology. So technology seems to be an important driver in that area where we're suddenly uh, confronting kind of important philosophical issues which nobody wants to address. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I did get into bioethics uh, in its fairly early days. It existed, but um, uh, fairly early on. And I uh, was the founding director of the first Australian uh, bioethics center at, at Monash University. Um, and technology certainly played a role in, in that uh, because uh, Australia and even specifically the uh, scientists at Monash University were among the pioneers of in vitro fertilization. Um, the, the very first in vitro fertilization uh, child was conceived in England as a result of work um, by Edwards and, um, and Steptoe. Um, but uh, the second and third, I think it was, uh, IVF births were in Australia. And the Australian team was also the first to show that you could freeze embryos and thaw them and uh, still have sound, healthy children from them. So there were a lot of pioneering steps that were taken. And for that reason, there was a lot of ethical interest in uh, what was happening here. And uh, so the university supported me in setting up a center that would study these questions. And to some extent, I suppose, um, provide a level of discussion that was lacking at the time in the community, that um, there wasn't really a lot of really serious reflection on these issues. There, was, there were heated statements from, on the one hand, the scientists, and on the other hand, particularly, I suppose, uh, religious groups that were opposed to this. Um, but there wasn't anything very much that was looking at it uh, at a higher, more thoughtful, more philosophical level of ethical discussion. So that's what I was trying to contribute to that field. And, and, and here, the, the, uh, uh, especially in the, the birth uh, of uh, children uh, who uh, were uh, incapacitated uh, through no fault of their own, uh, there was a failure or a debate within the medical community to uh, uh, make a decision about continuing life versus discontinuing life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this was a whole moral area that, that had to be explored. Yes, that was certainly another um, issue that it, where, again, technology played a role. Um, uh, Having set up the center at Monash University, we were approached by doctors who were dealing with uh, newborn intensive care. And uh, one of the conditions that they were concerned about was uh, spina bifida, which at that stage was much more common than it is now because the connection with taking folic acid during pregnancy was not known. Uh, and also there was less um, prenatal diagnosis. Uh, so we had these uh, babies born with some very severe cases of spina bifida. And if they'd been born in the 50s, they would have died um, because there wasn't the technology to keep them alive. But in the 60s, uh, doctors developed the means to keep them alive. And then having done that, um, in uh, particular, uh, a doctor called John Lauber in England, 
um, who was in an area with a very high rate of spina bifida. And he had, through his technology, um, saved the lives of um, maybe hundreds of these children. But then they kept coming back to his clinic. They kept needing more medical attention. They needed repeated operations. Some of them had had 40 operations by the time they were 10 or 12 years old. Uh, they were often still so very severely disabled. Uh, in some cases uh, with significant uh, intellectual disability as well. And he started to reevaluate what he'd been doing and saying, well, was it really right to save the lives of these children? Should we let them die? And uh, so Australian doctors were also troubled by those issues and they came to talk to us at the Monash Centre uh, to get some ethical discussion going. And we looked at what they were doing and, and um, we had to agree that there were some cases where it was not actually desirable to prolong the lives of these children. Um, but the only thing that they could do was simply not treat them and hope that they would die fairly soon. And that's where this distinction between acts and omissions that you mentioned comes in. Because as a utilitarian, it seemed to me that once you make the decision that it's better that this infant should die, then there's no real moral difference between allowing the infant to die through basically benign neglect and giving the child a lethal injection. And in fact, there's a lot to be said in favor of the lethal injection because then the child will die swiftly and without further suffering, whereas otherwise the child may linger for weeks or months in a fairly distressed state, very distressing for the parents and hospital staff as well. Um, so we were saying, look, if this is what you're going to do and we think it sometimes is justified in deciding that it's better the child should not live, then why not allow doctors to actively end the lives of the children? And, and in, in uh, some of what you wrote at this time, you, you point out that uh, there, there was a definitional issue here that uh, uh, would, uh, the definitions that would, the doctors would come up with wouldn't hold as uh, circumstances change. So there was a whole effort to say, well, we can do things uh, if there's brain death, but then that whole definition uh, seemed less and less, uh, uh, had to be redefined. Well, um, I mean, around this period, death was being redefined in terms of brain death yeah. um, because hospitals didn't know what to do with patients who could be supported in the sense that their hearts could be kept beating, blood could be kept circulating, but there was no brain activity at all and there was absolutely no prospect that they would ever recover um, in any way. So um, uh, starting out with a Harvard committee that examined this and then moving on to a president's uh, commission that looked at it, essentially the definition of death got changed to declare these people dead. Um, to my point of view, while that, that undoubtedly had a desirable result, because it's true that there was no point in keeping these people on, on respirators uh, when there was no prospect of them ever recovering consciousness, um, I thought it was, in a way, a slightly underhand way of achieving that objective, mm -hmm. that it would have been more honest to say, not that they're dead, because their bodies definitely seem to be still alive, um, but to say that, uh, there was no benefit to keeping them alive. That although they were living human beings, it was permissible to end their lives because without any prospect of consciousness uh, returning, there was no value or benefit to anyone, to either to, neither to them nor to anyone else, in keeping them alive. Uh, in this bioethics uh, area, it would seem that the whole problems we're having with medical costs are going to open up uh, a whole new domain where we, we have to weigh this other value of how much it costs uh, and should we be doing things that just uh, prolong life for a short time. Talk a little about that. I mean, is, is this going to be the, the next area of, uh, well, it probably already is an area which uh, bioethics are going to have to define the questions and come up with some, at least philosophically, with the answers. It already is an area, although in the United States um, there's a reluctance to talk about it openly. But in other countries, in Britain or Australia or in Europe, I think it's already understood that 
uh, healthcare resources are limited, um, they're not infinite, and uh, we ought to do the most good that we can with the resources we have. And doing the most good that we can is probably not um, using all the medical technology at our disposal to prolong the life of somebody who is uh, clearly dying and is going to be dying within a week or a month, uh, has poor quality of life, in some cases may have dementia or other conditions like that, uh, that this is not getting good value for our money and um, it's not even good for the patient. So uh, the idea that we are going to have to ration our resources is something that is generally accepted in most countries and it's only in the United States that there's been a very slow and reluctant uh, acceptance of that idea that healthcare resources, even in a wealthy society, are not infinite. Uh, in, in, I, I think this was in your bi uh, autobiographical essay. You, you talk about the, uh, the problem of imperfect information, powerful interests, and a desire not to know uh, disturbing facts. I think you identified those as problems one, once philosophically you've grappled with a problem uh, to why you don't see the kind of improvement you might want to uh, when you link the philosophical conclusions to, to a kind of activism. Yeah, I think that's right. And I guess that quote that you just read applies particularly to the animal area because um, you have powerful corporate interests, you have agribusiness, huge corporations that have vested interest in continuing the system. Uh, and also you have consumers who are just in the habit of eating animal products and uh, would really rather not know about how they're produced because they kind of have a, a vague sense that if they do know, they'll get uncomfortable with what they're eating. So better just to turn away. Why do I have to watch that video of, um, you know, intensive pig farms or uh, cruelty to, to chickens or, or ha laying hens on the farms. Um, so people don't like to watch this sort of thing. Um, and that's what makes it difficult to actually reach the public um, to get them just, just to know basic things like, like how is your food produced? I mean, that seems to me clearly an ethical responsibility. If you're going down the supermarket to vote with your dollars in favor of producing pork or chicken, for instance, Oughtn't you to know what happened to the pigs and chickens before they were turned into those plastic wrap packages on the shelf? So, so it seems that, that you really are committed uh, in your life's work to the, the application of reason to, to, in a way, change the world by sorting through the problems and the confusion uh, that deny us clarity so we can think about it. Yeah, I think that puts it very well. I certainly am committed to the application of reason, not just to our thought, but to the way we live. Now, let me read you uh, one last thing. I want to read you a quote, actually, which came from an interview on 60 Minutes, which I thought, after uh, exploring your work, was a nice summary. You, you said to Dan, rather, my ethics come from considering the consequences of my actions for all those that get affected by them. I'm prepared to say that, in a sense, my ethics is a kind of golden rule. The idea of saying, how would you like it if this were done to you? is fundamental to my sense of ethics because I think that's what ethics is about. It's about getting beyond yourself and looking at the effect that you're having on others. Absolutely, yes. I certainly still hold ex exactly that view. I think that the golden rule is a wonderful tool for um, thinking about what you're doing ethically rather than just from a self-interested point of view. And it ought to be putting ourselves in the position of all those affected by our action, whether they are like us, uh, let's say, you know, um, in my case, uh, white males in developed countries, or whether they're people, you know, African women, uh, let's say, uh, living in poverty, or even to the extent that we can understand what it's like uh, if they are um, a sow living in a narrow stall on concrete uh, unable to walk around for most of her life, or a hen unable to stretch her wings in a, in a cage. Um, we have to do our best to put ourselves in the position of, of these beings as well, because they, they are sentient beings, 
and they are affected by our actions. And then one final question, how would you advise students to prepare for the future if, if they want to uh, combine philosophy with activism? Well, I would say um, live your lives to some purpose and think about your career choice. There's actually quite a new uh, organization uh, that has been set up to encourage people to think about career choices in an ethical way. It's called 80,000 hours because that's roughly the amount of time that students from graduating might spend on their career throughout their lives. So if you uh, look up 80,000, just written as numerals, uh, 80,000 hours.com, I think it is, um, you'll get some interesting discussion about uh, ethical career choices. And in contrast, you know, many people think, well, somebody like me would advocate going into NGOs, working for Oxfam or working for people for the ethical treatment of animals or an organization like that. Well, yes, they may be good choices, but um, you know, if you're really committed, say, to reducing global poverty, uh, there's some arguments that say that if you have the ability to earn large amounts of money by going into investment banking, um, as long as you maintain your values and commitment and uh, give away what you don't need, which will be a very large sum if you're successful, uh, to organizations fighting global poverty or protecting the environment or working for animals, um, you could maybe be even more effective uh, in those sorts of careers. So, so it's, not, it's not as obvious as you might think uh, what young people ought to do or to focus on doing when they graduate. Professor Singer, on that uh, positive note, thank you very much uh, for thank coming you. on it's our been program. Great talking to you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Mm -hmm.